So Robert, you're famous for the Giza Orion theory. Um, can you just probably give us a small premise of the original theory um, of, and maybe show us what the ex procession of the equinox is all about and how that fits into the Giza Orion theory? Well, the Orion correlation theory um, uh, was born if, uh, in the early 80s. I happened to be uh, working in Saudi Arabia and uh, to, to put it extremely simple, because it is in fact a simple theory, it's one of those curious ones, mm. it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like the apple falling on somebody's head and he, and he gets it, he gets it. What's curious about this theory, uh, starting uh, uh, from the other end of the, of the position, is that it's extremely visible, it's extremely obvious, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that once you see it, Everybody sees it. Mm -hmm. The curious thing is that nobody saw it. <laughs> and uh, the reason I saw it, uh, apart from many other personal involvement, but the reason I saw it is that I was working in engineering in Saudi Arabia and I, I was very into uh, the alignments and setting out of buildings, sure. in particular the desert. So it was one of those things, you know, working with, uh, with, uh, with, with buildings in the desert. You often ask questions, you know, why is one in this direction and the other not in this direction and the sun and so forth. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, uh, what intrigued me about looking at the plan of Giza was that uh, there was an anomaly. There's something that looked weird. You had two pyramids of the same size uh, running on a diagonal and a third one offset, mm -hmm. uh, a smaller one offset. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't fit it into the context of what Egyptologists were saying. You know, they were saying the, each pharaoh came and built a pyramid and the, the, the reason there is a small one is the pharaoh was not as big as the other or, or as rich as the other. Or, it doesn't fit. What I was looking at I was, uh, from it being involved in this trade was uh, I felt I was looking at a, at a plan. This looked like a plan. You know, three monuments of the same design, uh, along two of them along a diagonal, and there you are. But I could explain the anomaly of the offset. So that was, that was the thing, the offset of the third pyramid. Was this niggling at you for a long time, or was it an epiphany? Did you just see no, it? No, 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 it, 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 it entered my mind, you know, the question entered my mind. Many, many discoveries usually is when you see something that is not explained. You know, like yeah. any other discovery. Uh, sometimes it's obvious, mm -hmm. and yet, surprisingly, nobody See. asked the question. So uh, my question was, why is the, the small pyramid offset? I mean, the, and for some reason, nobody asked the question. I, I guess the thing then, Robert, from uh, you have an engineering eye, that's what you um, first seen it, you, you applied your engineering eye, and you see the ground plan, the sky ground plan of Orion with the Giza Plateau. But, there is also pyramid text to back this up. With, uh, if you could maybe just elaborate on yeah, the pyramid what text and the context of this. Okay, it, 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 let me take it step by step. You have 25 royal pyramids in the Memphite necropolis, this area of desert near Cairo. Mm -hmm. uh, the Giza necropolis is the one that everybody knows, it's uh, the universally known, where you have the three sure. famous pyramids. It was known for a long time that the, uh, that the, the pyramids individually were set along the cardinal directions and the great pyramid of course being the, the most precise so immediately there is astronomy there if you like mm -hmm. uh, the other thing was that uh, that is the the most bizarre thing about the monuments of the fourth dynasty by the way these are pyramids of the fourth dynasty <coughs> the pyramids of the fourth dynasty which are of the, the Giza necropolis so here we have pyramids that immediately invite astronomy. Mm -hmm. They are direct to the current directions. The other thing is that the, the Giza pyramids, as is well known, do not contain texts. They are they, devoid of any texts, mm. which in itself is, is a mystery. That's one of the great mysteries of the, great, of the pyramids of Giza, is that before they built the pyramids, we know the Egyptians used texts, so they knew how to write. Many, many temples sure. and tombs that contain texts previous to building the pyramids. And we know that they did this afterwards. And we know that there are pyramids, indeed, following the Giza pyramids, that are loaded with texts. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, 
what's different with these. And the thought came in my mind that they're expressing themselves in a different way. And since there is astronomy there, and let's look at the pyramid texts and see what they say. And the pyramid texts are they're very metaphoric, of course. We're dealing with occult texts that are 5,000 years old, but it's very obvious to somebody who knows astronomy, sure. a basic astronomy, that these are texts that speak metaphorically of astronomical events. The, the, but the bottom line is this, the king, uh, when he dies, he is supposed to be converted into a spiritual entity, or a spiritual body, if you like, and somehow goes to the stars. And the stars that they want him to go to are the constellation of Orion. The reason being that Orion represented the god Osiris, the, the founder of the Egyptian pharaonic civilization. Mm -hmm. So that's in simple terms what the pyramid texts say. There is elaborate rituals, of course, but basically that's the intention. So the pyramids are, if you like, and this is a difficulty because we have to use modern language. They're, they're a kind of launching pad, if you like. Uh, the, I see them more like the hardware of a metaphysical science. Mm -hmm. In other words, that the intention of those who build it was to somehow send the Pharaoh to the stars. Now, it's a question of belief. I'm not into whether it's true or not true, whether they could do it or not do it. They believed it and they somehow felt that they need this hardware. Very much like a computer, you know. They, mm -hmm. I, see, I see the whole thing as, uh, to put it in, in, in modern jargon, the pyramids are hardware. The, the, the software, if you like, is the ritual. It's, like, it's a program, if you like. Sure. Uh, or, or later, the pyramid text, if you like. It's a, it's a coded program. Mm -hmm. And the processor, and that's an interesting one. The processor is the machinery of the sky. So that's how they, s they, they must have seen it. There is, there, is a, there is an energy going around the pyramid, the motion of the sun and the stars and so forth. And somehow all this together can, in their mind, create a spiritual entity and launch the king to the stars. So that's how you have to see them. Mm -hmm. So the pyramids are metaphysical machines. They're not practical machines. This is one of the problems that I have with a lot of researchers. They're not electrical plants. They're not nuclear plants. They're not. Uh, they're totally useless from a practical point of view. There's a pile of stones, but from a metaphysical point of view, they're they're, they're supreme. Mm -hmm. Now the question is how they what how did they intend doing it? I'm not going to go into that, but it's it's it seems that in their mind they could bring down, bring down the sky, they could somehow create a link. So they, they perceived the land as a kind of cosmic land. It had a, a direct access, a sort of as above, so below uh, idea. And they visualized the Nile as being the Milky Way, and they built these pyramids, and this is where I come in, in a position relative to the Nile, and in an angle relative to the Nile, and in this position, exactly the way that Orion's belt is in the sky relative to the Milky Way. And there, there is inside the pyramid, although not text, there are shafts shooting from the chambers. Mm -hmm. One of these shafts was known previous to me in, for, since the 1960s, pointing to Orion's belt. So here you have pyramid text saying the king wants to go to Orion. You have a shaft inside the Great Pyramid pointing to Orion's belt at the time of construction, about 2500 BC. And you have the pattern exactly two large pyramids with a small one offset, two large in a row, the small offset, two bright stars with a small star offset, adjacent to the Nile at an angle, pyramids adjacent to the uh, stars adjacent to the Milky Way at an angle. So it's, it's a kind of map in the sky, if you like, brought down. So you have to, you have to approach it this way. And uh, frankly, I have problems with others who try to see them as something else. Mm. The pyramid texts are very, very clear. Well, clear in as far as the intention. The, the pharaoh belongs to a stellar dynasty. He came from the stars, or his ancestors came from the stars, and when he dies, he returns there. And the location is very clear, Orion constellation. And there you are. I mean, so that's, that's basically what you've got there. Now, the, the, the priesthood is gone, the, uh, the civilization is gone, but the hardware is there. It's still there. That's the beauty of it. We can study it.
In fairness, you have a big part in helping archaeoastronomy develop and, and popular. There's a lot of archaeoastronomy all around the world now from various sites. Um, the key thing for that to know is precession of the equinox and how that affects monuments because they star slip over time. But is there direct evidence because this number 72 comes up with Osiris? Um, yeah, the body, well, the body, the body, the body gets chopped into 72 parts. Is that a processional yeah. number? Do you see a direct link for procession? Yeah, no, I, um, Osiris was chopped in 14 parts. But let, let, me, oh. let me explain all this. Uh, first of all, what is precession? Uh, sure. In very simple terms, uh, we know that our world we live in is a globe, it rotates on its axis, we get the, the effects of light and day, it goes around the sun, we get the effects of the seasons, mm -hmm. but it also wobbles, but it wobbles very, very slowly, like a spinning top going very, very slowly. This gives the appearance, we're moving, but it gives the appearance that the sky is actually wobbling. In, in a cycle of 26,000 years. Now this is extremely useful for those who study ancient cultures, especially cultures that have their religion related to the sky, have monuments aligned. Because if you know, if they were aiming at certain stars, then all you have to do is precess the sky backwards to the date. And you see the sky as they saw it. We have computer programs that can do this. And you can date these monuments. You can, you can literally see, or virtually see, what these people saw. So it's an extremely powerful tool if you know how to use it. And nowadays anybody can use it. We, we buy programs uh, off, the, off the internet for $100, $200, and they're as powerful and as accurate as any astrophysics can do the calculations for you. So precession is a tool and a tool to, to apply to ancient cultures and particularly their monuments. Now here we have the pyramids that are aligned to the cardinal direction, but cardinal directions are useless in a sense because the cardinal direction is the same no matter what epoch. But we know that there were shafts pointing to stars inside the Great Pyramid. So all we have to do, and we're using the text because we have a good guess, yes, they might have wanted to point these shafts towards Orion and, and the star Sirius, by the way, which mm -hmm. I'm one of the discoverers in, in, in the Great Pyramid. And so you, here's the shaft pointing to the sky, and you bring the stars to the point in the direction of the, of the alignment of the shafts, and bang, you have a date. So, precession is, is, is used this way. As far as the ancient Egyptians are concerned, what is extremely useful is something else. It isn't just precession. It is something we call the Sotic Cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, the Sotic Cycle is very simply the fact that they had a calendar of 365 days, but they didn't adjust for the quarter day difference, or slightly quarter day difference, that we do. We know every four years we add an extra day mm -hmm. to bring back our calendar to the true astronomical year. Sure. They didn't. They just let it drift. Now, if you let the calendar drift, you lose a day every four years. It's as simple as that. And every eight years, you lose two days and so forth. So the calendar would take 1,461 years to return back to point zero. Like a tachometer in a car, if you like. Mm. <laughs> Bring it back to zero. This is very useful because the, if they give us a date of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what we call a sotic date. Now, they lock their calendar. They began their calendar when they observed the star Sirius rising at dawn. Now, as the calendar drifted, the star stays more or less in the same place. As the calendar drifted, so they tell us, for example, we have sotic dates in their, uh, in their text saying the king was crowned on the third month, on the fifth day of the third month of the year, uh, when Sirius was rising on that day. Mm -hmm. So all we have to do is count the number of, of, of uh, days from the day one of their calendar, from the, the New Year's Day, mm -hmm. and we can date, provided we know the beginning of the calendar, and we know that. Egyptologists have worked this one out. So astronomy, if you like, and understanding how calendars work with astronomy, mm -hmm. you can use this tool to date, but now we're moving into a much higher level, which is what I do now with my, my, my books like the... Because the Orion Correlation Theory, what it did, 
apart from making us realize that they had a plan and they looked like the stars of Orion. What it did is it opened up a window. Yeah. It said, wait a minute, we can read them without texts. Astronomy becomes the, the language, if you like. And therefore, by using astronomy in an ancient monument that does not have texts, and there are many in the world, not just the pyramids, you can extract what they had in mind. Perhaps we'll never know exactly what they had in mind, but we can extract. For example, they have a monument pointing to the summer solstice. Um, well, so they're interested in the summer solstice. What happened in the summer solstice in Egypt? The Nile flooded. So we begin to read them. We begin to speak the language that they had in mind when they built those monuments. And this is the, the latest cutting-edge approach with people like Tom Brophy and myself and Robert Schock and others who have been examining these monuments. Mm -hmm. Is that by using this approach, by using this approach, you can decipher a, a, a monument that does not have text. We, we've used it extensively on my last book, which is Imhotep the African, mm -hmm. Architect of the Cosmos. Here we have the very first architectural project the, the, the Saqqara complex, it does not contain text. There's very little text. Yeah. And yet it's an enormous project. And there is alignments, there is strange uh, structures, there is a pyramid in the center of it, there is, a, there is a huge boundary wall, there is panels and so forth. The idea was to say, okay, what's the brief here? We, we know that the intention was to build this hardware, if you like, to send the pharaoh into the sky. So what would I do today if I was given this metaphysical brief, you know, how, how would I make this, this structure somehow useful to this ritual? And we approach it this way, and you count the panels, we look at the alignments, we measure the walls, and lo and behold, it begins to read like a book. So, the strange thing about these architects, and by the way, most architects today will agree, the strange thing about these architects is that especially the early ones, the pyramid builders, the Saqqara builders, is that they seem to have used what today we would call a universal language. They use mathematics, yep. numbers, and they use astronomy, which we can use today, and anybody can use at any time, even on some different planet, because yep. it's the universal language. Very, very interesting why they did this. It's, it's a big mystery, because they seem to have used this for anybody to be able to read it. Because remember, when, when the hieroglyphs were used in these monuments, until the, uh, the last century, so 4,000 years, nobody could read them. There's no point writing in English or in Chinese, because in 10,000 years from now, people won't know this language. But if you use mathematics, if you use astronomy, if you use numbers, if you use directions, anybody can read them. And this is what is becoming very, very interesting, not just to understand these these uh, these people, these ancient cultures. But the big question is, what motivated them? You know, who are they? <laughs> you know, that's the big question. You know, why did they think in those terms? You know, they weren't primitive people, they seem to be thinking in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that today our scientists think. You know, we're getting more and more away from written language. You know, computers. You know, kids today uh, play with numbers and, and codes and and this is universal. So, sure. You mentioned in in Hotep, um, he was linked with Djoser, Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit in Hotep who this guy was. He was the, uh, like you say, he was the Da Vinci of uh, the ancient. Well, I've, I've used the the, the 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 beautiful analogy. I said he's the Da Vinci, the Einstein, the, the Newton, all rolled into one, including Galileo. Uh, Frankly, we don't know much about him from a textual point of view, mm. and we have we haven't found his tomb. In, in other words, he's I, I call him the Jesus of antiquity. You know? <laughs> a lot of people talk about him, but we haven't found Jesus. You know, some people say he didn't even exist. We know Imhotep existed. There's no doubt about it, and we know that he was the high priest of Heliopolis at the time of King. Djoser. King Djoser is the pharaoh of the third, the pharaoh of the third dynasty, pre-pyramid age. This is the, the literally at the at the doorstep of what is going to begin now, the pyramid age. This five six hundred years of pyramid building. So you've got to visualize the, the the setting. There is no buildings in Egypt. That nobody has ever built a structure using hewn stone and architecture. 
there are crude buildings made of mud and so forth, but nowhere in the world, by the way, yet. And here comes this architect, or, or rather this high priest of, of the sun cult, of the, of, the, of the rebirth cult of the pharaoh. And for the very first time, he gets, either it's his idea or it's the pharaoh's idea, he gets what I call the commission. We want to do a project, we want to do a something, we want to do a machine, a metaphysical machine, that will satisfy the desire of the king and perform these rituals. It's the very first time ever in Egypt. And, and there it is, it's still there. I mean, so we have to take him as a genius. He, he must have been a genius because he's incorporated mathematics, He's incorporated astronomy. His designs, his design is kind of stunning. And to an architect seeing the site, being the very first architectural project, it's stunning. I mean, some people go there and think, my God, I mean, it looks like brand new, some places. You, you have beautiful fluted columns, you have uh, the proportions are very well studied. Uh, there's beautiful arching uh, uh, structures. It's amazing. So you've got this this brain, this, this uh, renaissance man of the, the, of the pyramid age, of the pharaonic age, who is not just a mathematician, he seems to be an astronomer, a special astronomer, he seems to, to know architecture, he has a, an amazing sense of design and proportion. In other words, a genius. That's how we read them. If you're just going to use the text like the, uh, like the Egyptologists do, you have three or four p lines that just give his title. So here is, the, 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 in my view, the beauty of, of a new approach. We're calling it the Arca Astronomy approach, but we're calling it the Universal Language approach. This is very cutting edge stuff. You know, there's a bunch of researchers, myself included, that are beginning to see that Egyptologists have missed a very powerful tool to read mm. the, the, the culture and even read individuals. You know, that's so, so that's what's being done. So wh who was Imhotep? Well, Imhotep was a genius. We don't know how he looked like. Perhaps one day we'll find his tomb. There's a, there's a bit of excitement, by the way, yeah. that a large tomb, the so-called Mastaba at Saqqara, has been found. Yes, uh, not yet uh, explored. Uh, so who knows? We might find physically. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, it'll be a, a stunning discovery because we're, we're going to discover this, this. We've never found, ever, ever, a body, physical body, of a royal pharaoh or any nobleman from the fourth dynasty. This is one of the great mysteries. We don't have that. So the very first physical find of a pharaoh, and it's very promising, by the way, we're, we're getting very close, as you know, with the great pyramid, yeah. there are these doors. So I that might, might, might be the, 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 the Tutankhamun discovery ten times over. Wow. Of, of the status of this man. I believe he was probably, like indeed most Egyp Egyptians at, at that time, yeah. probably a, a black African, or a, certainly of black African descent. There is a whole argument put forward in the book. I know Egyptians today and Egyptologists today would cringe at this, but the evidence is overwhelming now that the, not only the, the, the very origins of the pharaonic civilization comes from the western desert, where there was a black prehistoric culture living there. But there is a link now with a site, probably, mm -hmm. of the first dynasty, we know this, Herenkompolis, but probably designed by Imhotep's father. We have the link now. These black African prehistoric people made contact at a very early stage. And it is almost very tempting to suppose that Imhotep's father was either one of those or very influenced by these people, or indeed of the same ethnicity. So hence why we call him the African. I think we need to place him in the right context. Sure. I think you're talking about a sophisticated monument that Imhotep has built, and the sophistication of all the ancient monuments implies that a precursor to the earliest of dynasties, the fourth dynasty, there was something there. And I think a lot of your work, staying away from the dirty word Atlantis that everybody uses, I think you could probably uh, talking about not to play and, and where that fits in because this pushes back uh, pre-dynastic uh, Egypt. The, uh, uh, there are two sites that are now being, have been very closely looked at. One in Egypt, which as you correctly mentioned, not to play, 
<laughs> I'll explain in a minute what it is. And the other one in Turkey, nearby Turkey, which is Gobekli Tepe. Mm. Let me tell you why they're so important, apart from their dating. Uh, both Napta Playa in Egypt, in the Western Desert, and Gobel Kitepi in, uh, in Turkey have been dated to something around 9,000 to 10,000 BC. Uh, that pushes the chronology, pushes the, 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 the date of, of civilization backwards. Why civilization? We knew there were people then, there's no question. I mean, uh, anthropologists knew this, but they didn't think it was civilization. They didn't think it was sophistication. Where these sites are extremely sophisticated, particularly with astronomy, mm. both sites. And amazingly, they seem to extract the very same astronomy, refining alignments. Okay, let's get to Napta Playa. Napta Playa was discovered in 1974. It took a long time for the anthropologists to realize that they were dealing with today what we call a ceremonial astronomical site. It wasn't a settlement, it was a place where people gathered, a bit like Stonehenge, and they would meet, sure. coming from various parts, we were not quite sure where, and they would meet there at certain times of the, of the year to perform rituals. And the rituals were celestial rituals. So what you have at Napta Playa is stone circles, uh, alignments with stones, very strange uh, rock, uh, rock gatherings. When you analyze this like we did with Imhotep, this was the analysis we began in 1997, the, the first sh big news that came out is a stone circle that is clearly calendrical, it has directions to the solstices, the, uh, therefore they were using the sun to, to date or to, to mark the, 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 the stages of the year. Mm -hmm. And then later on we found that there were stellar alignments emanating from a particular uh, conglomeration of rocks, which we call Temple A, and like the spokes of a, of a bicycle wheel, they, they shoot out in various directions. Mm -hmm. The majority of them go towards the east and the north. And when we uh, analyzed what they were aiming at, at the date that we have from carbon dating, well, they were aiming at Orion's belt, they were aiming at Ceres in the east, they were aiming at the Big Dipper in the, in the north exactly what the pyramid does 3,000 3, years later. So, <coughs> here you are. What we thought was original to ancient Egypt, particularly the pyramid buildings, this kind of astronomy, well, no. It began in the Sahara. It began there. So it completely changes the picture of what we're looking at. We're looking at not only a much older civilization, but we're looking at a very sophisticated civilization. And what Nafta Playa brings out, and this to me is one of the most amazing things, is that not only they align towards the stars, but they track them. We're very sure of this. So you have uh, alignments of stones and they change them very slightly. They were tracking the motion of the stars, the apparent motion of the stars. In other words, they were tracking, they were tracking precession. Mm. And this is a stunner, because precession was not supposed to have been discovered until the time of the Greeks let alone tracking it. Here we have people doing it 10,000 years ago. And the same is coming out gradually at in Turkey, in Gobekli Tepe. So the whole picture is changing. And I think it, when you're talking back 10,000 years, that brings us back to the Giza Plateau because we've also looked at the alignment of the Sphinx. And the Sphinx has been called into question for the dating of 2500 BC by the Egyptologists because of the water weathering. But perhaps tell us about the Sphinx, its alignments, and its now more, even more important at this date because of the sites of Napta Playa and Quebec Latin. Absolutely. I mean, when when, when uh, I wrote The Keeper of Genesis with Graham Hancock, uh, I remember, I mean, I remember the day. <laughs> I called Graham and I said, listen, uh, there's something very funny here because he knew extremely well, of course, my Orion correlation theory. And uh, I called, uh, in, the, in my book, The Orion Mystery, I had suggested that they were aligning the pyramids on the ground, not to the time that Egyptologists said, 2500 BC. Because, mm -hmm. very briefly, let me explain. The pyramids are at an angle of 45 degrees relative to the meridian. Mm -hmm. The stars that they represent on the ground in 2500 BC are not at that same angle. They're much more sharp, about 17 degrees to, uh, to the vertical. So. I process them back and I use the reasoning because they speak in the text of a beginning. They speak of the beginning of Osiris 
of their era, if you like, like we speak of the time of Jesus. And they speak of this beginning of Osiris as if it's happening in the sky. Well, yes, it does, because of precession. So I, we precess the stars down, and lo and behold, when you bring them down to the beginning of the precession cycle, Orion's belt matches what's on the ground. So that was in my book, The, the, the Orion Mystery. But I happen to be toying around. In those days, we had very primitive uh, programs. While we were writing Keeper of Genesis, and I pressed 10,500 BC to look again at this correlation. And then I thought, let's see what's happening elsewhere. And I pressed east. And <laughs> at the same time that Orion's belt was matching the pyramids on the ground, Orion's belt at the meridian in the south, matching what's on the ground, at that precise moment, the constellation was, of Leo was rising due east in the direction of the Sphinx. And I thought, amazing, <laughs> the coincidence cannot be. So I phoned Graham and I said, listen, uh, I know they're not going to like this, but we're going to have to suggest that the Sphinx, because of the geological argument that was being put also at the same time, with Robert Schock and John West, mm -hmm. they were arguing that the Sphinx was much older because of the erosion around the Sphinx and on the Sphinx. Well, here we are coming with astronomy. Two hard sciences are going to say the same thing. And as you may or may not remember, you, you were probably very young in those days. Uh, Hell broke loose. Sure. Yeah, I, I think, uh, from what I remember, Zep Tepe is the first one. Do you think that the, when they talk about Zep Tepe, uh, of course, Quebecly Tepe has got a similar name as well. I don't know if there's yes, any, any, uh, any connotation with that, but uh, the Zep Tepe was the first one. Do you think this was this special date that they attributed for some reason, a processional reason or a cosmological reason? I, well, first of all, I think that what's coming out of all this is that the sky is being used, or was being used, as a kind of billboard. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's there written, their history is written in the sky. Once you understand this, once you understand that certain constellation represents certain individuals in their history, and that they, it changes with time, so you, you, you can date, you can use it as a book if you like. So we use precession, we say, okay, this is era so-and-so, and this is what's happening. So that's number one. Why 10,500 BC, give or take, by the way, it's, we have to allow a certain margin, uh, is probably, some people have said, well, the end of the Ice Age or the beginning of, uh, of something. Uh, now we're beginning to suspect that there might have been a comet strike. Mm -hmm. This is the latest approach. Uh, Strangely, the ancient Egyptians were very into the veneration of a sacred object that probably launched the Pyramid Age. It's a stone that was kept at the Temple of Heliopolis, which we, I'm the person who did the, the study on this, which is now accepted, was almost certainly a meteorite, uh, a large meteorite, probably about 15 tons, uh, in the shape of a pyramid. Uh, what we call a oriented pyramid, uh, uh, oriented meteorite. There, there are certain large uh, iron meteorites that retain their flight direction, a bit like a bullet. And as they enter the atmosphere, they burn from the top. And, and, they, and they literally fall on the ground uh, if they don't explode. If they're of a certain size, they will fall at free fall uh, on the last three, four kilometers and they simply thud on the ground. If they fall on a soft spot like sand, you find them intact. But you find them in this strange shape of a cone or a pyramid. We know they had one of those. Many other cultures, by the way, probably had the same thing, but sticking to that. So it seems that they were impressed by something that fell from the sky uh, around that time. Uh, it's very tempting. It's the Ben Ben stone. It's, yes, the famous Ben Ben stone. Black ben ben stone yeah. This, 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 this stone was kept at Heliopolis. It probably inspired the idea of a pyramid. I believe it inspired the idea of a star object. And hence the pyramids, in a sense, become stylized stars. That's why this correlation. They're building stars. They're building talismanic stars. That's how I see them. Now, we know from recent research that there was indeed a very large meteorite strike around 10,000, 9,000 BC. It may have been global. There may have been large fragments of this meteorite that struck in South America, if I understand well. 
and caused havoc. And maybe this is marking something. This is marking a beginning, marking a... It was around the time of the Ice Age, it probably caused the mini Ice Age. So we're looking at something that happened, something like, like a proto-civilization was there. It kind of got obliterated. This is Graham, Graham's Hancock idea, as you know. Mm -hmm. And then there's a beginning. There's a kind of restart. There's, there seems to be some kickoff. And, and the pyramid builders seem to be very, very intensely aware of this and very, very, if this is true, very keen to, to preserve the knowledge, preserve the, the presence, mark it. It may well be that we have in these monuments a kind of message, a kind of warning, I don't know. It smells like this sometimes, it's kind of spooky. On the Sphinx, a lot of people have talked about a chamber. I know Zaihi Huas is not in uh, Egypt anymore. Do you think there's going to be a chance for the chamber to be opened? Is there a chamber there? Do you? Do you the, the truth is that there is no smoking gun evidence of a chamber. Having said this, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Yeah. Uh, First of all, physical uh, research. There's been seismographic work done there in the 90s, in the early 90s, and then later radar penetration. Uh, there seems to be a large, two large cavities under there, one under the poles of the Sphinx, and one under the rump. Uh, strangely, the one under the rump concords with the conclusion I came with the astronomy, because the astronomy says when you analyze it this way, it says, hey, we have a map in the sky. The, the constellation of Rio represents the Sphinx on the ground. So what are they telling us there? They're showing us a spot somewhere under the, the constellation of Leo, which is the, the spring equinox. Mm -hmm. So if we put this on the ground, if we take that map and, 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 and put it in the place of the Sphinx, they seem to be marking a spot under the ramp of the Sphinx, and strangely, they found with radar penetration the possibility of a chamber. I have not seen the reports, the, the, as you know, it's all hush hush, but I know the people who did it, and they're very convinced that there is some large cavity under there. I suspect that there probably is some sort of chamber. Uh, the, the other one, of course, is the, the, the famous doors inside the Great Pyramid. Sure. And uh, that, that is the big deal, because we, we know there's doors, there's, we know this since the early 90s, there is the famous Gantebrick door in the southern shaft of the King's Chamber, of the Queen's Chamber, and then uh, National Geographic found the same in the northern shaft of the Queen's Chamber. They're still unopened, mm -hmm. and the odds are extremely high now because we have two doors of finding something. When Gantebrick uh, sent the robots in, didn't he find a piece of wood, and they were able to carbon date from that? No, no, no. The, he, he filmed a piece of wood wow. in the northern shaft. And when he filmed the southern shaft, the, the famous Gantebrick door, there were what we think were copper handles or, or brass, um, uh, almost certainly copper, maybe bronze, but there was a lot of arguments about this. Uh, we don't know what happened to these things. Uh, the, the piece of wood was there, I mean, I've, I've seen it, I mean, with, with the video cameras from the robotic machine, but whether it's been taken out by National Geographic, whether uh, the, the strange thing about this exploration is that there hasn't been any serious reporting. I haven't seen articles. I haven't seen. Uh, I haven't seen anything. Uh, the, the, you, there are people like you and, and, and other media who come to ask me because they're not getting the information from the Egyptologists. It would be the most important piece of wood that was ever found in Egypt. For if it's con well, it seems to be contemporary. I mean, anything found in these shafts of the Queen's Chamber are contemporary with the monument, because as you know, the, the shafts were closed, yeah. both ends, yeah. so it's like a, like a can. So anything found in there is contemporary with the monument. We'll find, well, there is the piece of wood, which you don't know what's happened to it. There is the, uh, the, the copper handles of Gantabrick door, mm -hmm. and there is, as you may have heard, inscriptions that were found behind the Gantabrick door, and it's two doors now. Yeah. There's a space of half a, half a meter, and that's interesting. Uh, my brother is very involved with this, with the inscriptions, because they turn out to be numbers. Numbers? Uh, yes, they turn out to be three numbers, a hundred, twenty, and one. Gives a number, a total of 121. Wow. 121, to, to, to somebody who's studying the pyramid, rings a bell. It's, it's 11 times 11. And we know that the pyramid is designed using the ratios. Yes. 
and the major number ratio is 11. There's a code there, if you like. Wow, it's like a mystery machine that just keeps on giving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the Great Pyramid is one of those, you know. And uh, it, it, it uh, you know, I've been at it for the last uh, 25 years. Uh, seriously at it, you know. I've studied the, the mon I've lived outside the Great Pyramid for three years. Believe me, I, I've, I know this monument. Sure. Um, I wanted to touch on the, the work that you wrote on Black Genesis and about the Africans. That, uh, perhaps just to let uh, the audience know that you know, the, was there an African, Black African race that kickstarted this? Was was there a mix of tribes or? Um, Th there is no doubt at all that genetics uh, studies have shown that modern man you and me, everybody on this planet, has their origins in Central East Africa about 200,000 years ago. In other words, that there was a proto-human, many forms of Homo erectus and Homo australis and so forth, but at one point, a woman, almost certainly a black African Homo erectus, gave birth to the first modern man, Homo sapien. Genetics show this. And we are literally sprung from this source. Now, we genetics also show, and anthropology show, that they stayed in this area for about, till about 60,000 years ago. And then some populated Africa, hence why we have the black African continent, and the others populated the rest of the earth, all the way to Australia. A group of them seem to have stayed and moved northwards towards what we call today the Chad. They stayed there for quite a while, many thousands of years, and then when the climatic conditions were ideal, that the Sahara was very fertile, by the way, because of the climatic cycles, they moved in what today we call the Sub-Sahara. And they moved in an area in e which is part of Egypt now, which uh, we, we call Gilf Kibir, it's a mountain area, and Jebel Waynat. It's, it's literally at the, at the junction where Egypt meets Libya and Sudan, in the extreme southwest. Very unexplored, it's still very untouched. And there is no doubt that there is evidence, strong evidence, of a presence of a people there. They left rock art and the drawings, uh, stone tools, and so forth. Mm -hmm. It is almost certainly these people that migrated eventually closer to the Nile, not yet at the Nile, and settled in areas and probably up the playa. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they developed a, a, a great knowledge because they were forced to. They were forced to move big distances because as the Sahara began to be more and more arid, the, the water receded, the, the rains formed temporary lakes, they had to move from water hole to water hole, and they began to navigate, they began to study the stars, they began to, to understand the machinery of the sky. And they settled at Napta Playa, well they settled around there, we don't have evidence of them living there, but they, see, they clearly settled around there. They stayed for a long time, and then, when they could not stay anymore, when the Sahara became totally arid, there was no more water, that's it, they moved to the Nile. And by that time, the Nile had become a very habitable place. It was very dangerous before. That there was very giant floods and, and, and it was that kind of messy area with marshes. By that time, the Nile was the paradise we see today. And they moved there with this cargo of knowledge. They, they knew astronomy, they knew how to move stones, they had domesticated cattle. And they inject this. This is, and they were black. There's no question. We see them, we have their drawings. And they, 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 they bring this to either a people who was there, maybe a uh, hunter-gatherers, or they themselves began. Of course, later on, there is a mix. People came from the Levant, people came from various places. We're beginning to suspect they even came from uh, what is today modern Arabia. And they began to mix. So that's why the Egyptians, by the time they reached the, the time of Tutankhamun, which we're talking about 3,000 years later, uh, yes, there is a very mixed uh, blood we find. Uh, so people are arguing on the wrong foot here. They say, well, Tutankhamun, you know, he probably was Caucasian, he probably was not black, he probably... Well, that's irrelevant, because we're not talk we have to talk about the source. The source was, I wouldn't even say almost certainly, I would say certainly, for sure, black African stock. 
and that's it. I mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's proven. It's it's over. There is no more discussion. Of course, it comes politically. We have uh, the people don't like it. I think a lot of people struggle with genetic makeup sometimes, and when you start talking skin colors, but there's also the makeup of the mind of these people. These these guys thought in different ways. They expressed themselves in different ways. Clearly, the model of ancient Egypt was, I think, in many ways, fantastic and superb. And, and I, I'd like us to go back to it someday. Um, perhaps, uh, obviously, we're, we're not going to give our technology up. But I think uh, last time we spoke, we were talking about spirituality, and we're talking about the consciousness of these guys, and we're talking about right and left brain. And I think a lot of people blame what they did on right brain behaviour, but I, as you said, there's recent evidence to say that you know perhaps the ancient Egyptians were able to go between the right and the left at will. Well, what I said is that the, the, the recent evidence from, uh, from scientists today, from brain scientists, is that uh, there's no such thing as left and right brain. It's, it's, it's something we invented. The, the brain is actually divided physically, but the thinking is, is overall uh, no, I don't want to get into that because it's not my field, but sure. apparently there isn't. What there is, is the ability to hop from one form of thinking to the other. You know, we clearly can think in practical terms, we can think in metaphysical terms, we can think in spiritual terms, we can think in emotional terms. So we have this ability to, to swing very quickly. The Egyptians, now, we are in a very practical civilization now. You know, we're in the day of science and technology. And therefore, our, our focus, our daily lives are very focused on the practical side of things, on, on the logical side of things. You have to drive your car, you have to go to work, you have to work on your computer, you have to cross the road. All these require a practical approach. But we're looking at a very different era. We're looking at a different era where this practical life was not so much intense. They didn't have cars, they didn't have a computer, they didn't have anything. And therefore, the focus was more on the metaphysical. They tried to deal with their existence from a metaphysical point of view. I believe they were internalizing. Um, uh, that's another thing that I'm very much into, the sort of Gnostic search that, that we had in the, in the Renaissance Europe. The, 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 the idea that the knowledge isn't just outside. There is, there is us. We contain knowledge. And, and that to me is very interesting because many people don't think it this way, but you know, we're an extraordinary machine. Each human being is an extraordinary piece of, of, of equipment, if you like. It functions on its own. The brain, the brain in there is instructing uh, a thousand instructions per second to maintain the movements, the, the, the blood flowing, the cells repairing. It has knowledge. Knowledge that we can't access, if you like. We don't know what the brain is doing. We know it's doing it, but we don't know how it's doing it. So if you can reach this somehow, if you can link up, if you can decipher our own brain, I think the ancient Egyptians attempted to do this. Maybe because they were forced to. And they, they, they internalized their search. In what happens have been one of those. And maybe they did understand existence perhaps better than we do. So to me, this is very interesting because if they did understand it or they understood a lot of it, they created a system of order that worked. You know, one of the wonderful things about ancient Egypt isn't just its pyramids, its monuments and artifacts. It's the fact that they survived for 3,000 years harmoniously, with great creativity, in peace. They had a system that worked and worked very well. They were in full coordination and full integration with their nature. They respected their nature. They respected life. Life was extremely precious in ancient Egypt, every individual. Uh, and they believed in an afterlife, a very strong belief. They, they, they really fitted themselves in a very cosmic environment, if you like. It's a beautiful model, because we, 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 have, we haven't found a model like this yet. You know, even, even the models that we, we, we hailed uh, 50, 60 years ago, you know, democracy, it's collapsing. We, we, we don't have something that is, what I believe, suited for a human existence. You know, we, we do the, the opposite. We, we, we've taken human beings to a point where they're so detached from their nature, they're so detached from their own nature, that they become dangerous because they become indifferent to nature, they become indifferent to life. It's what we're seeing around the world today. 
we need to reconnect, we need to have a system that puts the human being back in his own context, in his own natural context. And then, yes, you have, you have a wonderful human being that, that integrates and respects his, his environment, respects his world. Sure. So the ancient Egyptians are that, if you like, to me. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah, and I think the way they express themselves, I think they use symbology as a key tool to express themselves and their concepts and their knowledge. Do you think uh, Jean-Francois Champollion, who cracked the hieroglyphs, as they say, he also believed that some of the hieroglyphs had another meaning, uh, maybe another esoteric. Do you believe they, yeah. they had another meaning? No doubt at all. Uh, when we look at a, a symbol, uh, especially uh, in, in that context of ancient Egypt, uh, the symbol has many layers. It isn't just one interpretation. I'll give you an example. I mean, let's use a modern symbol. If you take the, the, the Christian cross. Yeah. Now, if you show it to somebody who has no idea about Christianity, then to him it's just you know, a cross. Yeah. That's it. It has no meaning. To a Christian, a cross signifies the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection, the redemption, mm -hmm. and whatever he knows about Christianity. To a monk who has studied and been imbued with the Christian religion, it has even more depth. Yeah. You follow? Yeah. So <coughs> the symbol has that depth, that depth of meaning. And Egyptologists have seen the surface. Sometimes they go one or two deep. Champollion believed that there is knowledge behind each symbol. Great knowledge. And indeed there is. But, but, the Egyptians used symbol not because it was one mean of, of communicating. They used symbol because the human mind reasons in symbols. We don't reason in words here. But the mind is working and, and converting what it sees converting what it hears, converting what it senses into symbols. A very, very, very amazing process in there. So we can symbolize things, we can symbolize uh, love, we can, you know, we do a heart, or we, or we do a rose. We can symbolize ideas. And once you understand that how this works, you know, the, the, the typical example, the metaphor we often use, is handing a rose to a woman. Well, you're not just handing a rose, right? Sure. The, 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 the symbol that you're, you're giving, and in the context you're giving, it isn't just the, sim the, the, the object itself, it's the context. Very different to giving a rose to a woman in the middle of a crowd on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the tube, or giving a rose in a fancy restaurant with candlelight. Completely different effect. And therefore, to understand how symbols work, you have to understand what we call cosmic ambience, the effect, the, the right location, to, to, to show the symbol in a place and in a context that has that effect. And therefore, I believe, coming back to the pyramids, that that's why they had pyramids. The, the, the pyramid creates an effect. It's scale. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's, I call it the giant question mark. You look at the pyramid. And, and it, it provokes questions, it, it stimulates the mind, it, 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 it agitates the mind. You, you, you begin to think in terms, why is it here, what's it for, why is it so big, who put it there, uh, uh, what does it mean? And therefore the context begins to take hold and your mind begins to get into that kind of state that you can get the message. Yeah. The ritual works. This is what, 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 what a mass is supposed to be. And, and today we've lost the, uh, the well, we don't even think in those terms. We don't recognize it. Well, we don't, we don't realize that this is how the human condition is made. We're the products of, of literally billions of years of evolution. We respond to the natural way that we're created, not the artificial way. We live in an artificial world now. So we're detached and we're getting more and more detached from the way that we're meant to respond to the world and to the cosmos. We won't understand it if we don't use that approach. Sure. Big question as an engineer, Robert, probably to finish on, I guess, then, uh, the engineering of the pyramid, like you described last time, which I wasn't aware of, that inside the core masonry is actually pretty rough in places. Um, yes. but the outside was pristine and nicely cased and 
But we talked about the Sphinx Valley Temple and that there's a massive ton stone in there. Perhaps just as an engineer, just tell us how difficult that is. Um, and maybe, do you have any opinions on how they moved heavy stones into place? Uh, yeah, the, the, the Valley Temples, the mortuary temples at Giza, uh, we have uh, surviving temples from the so-called Sphinx Temple and the adjacent uh, mortuary temple. And another one next to the east side of the pyramid. We have the same with the third pyramid. The ones, unfortunately, the Great Pyramid have been totally ruined. From these temples, it's, it's, it really does not take a rocket engineer to realize that we're looking at a very different construction than those who build the pyramids. Yeah. Uh, first, the size of the blocks. They're amazingly large. Uh, the average size of the blocks to build those temples were about 50 tons. There are, however, some blocks that exceed 150 tons. There is one of them that's 200 tons. Spooky. Uh, I use the analogy, as you know, if you take uh, 400 family cars, 400 family cars, and you squish them, you get one of these blocks. Yeah. And there are dozens and dozens of them. So, the big question is how do they lift those blocks? How do they place them? Because it's a very confined area, the temples are not that big. You know, the, 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 the mind boggles how and why <laughs> to me why would they want to use blocks of this kind let alone how they move them why is the big question not, not I, I think the why is it because they did move them there's no question so the, 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 I suppose one day we'll figure out how they did it, uh, it it's, it's, it's odd for a, a construction engineer to think that people given the context we're told that did not have uh, machines did not have lifting devices they didn't have iron they didn't have the pulley. Uh, in that context, it's very difficult for a construction engineer to visualize how they did this. Mm -hmm. And I know we see Egyptologists doing this fancy virtual reality graphs and you know, no, 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 no. The reality is on the ground and on the ground I cannot see how this is done. But the big question is why? Because you really do not need blocks of this size to build a temple and we know that they knew this. Or at least they knew this in the pyramid age. So maybe these, these structures, because they look very old as well, maybe they're much, much older. And this would perhaps join up with the evidence that we have with the Sphinx, the Sphinx alignment, the Sphinx geology, and that apply and so forth. It seems, and I, I know Robert Schock is very much into that uh, yeah. way of thinking, that these temples pre-existed the pyramids. But having said this, is a big why. Uh, I, 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 can't, I don't have the answer yet. The only answer is not practical. It cannot be for practical reasons. Symbolic or well, it's, it's even symbolic is not working. It works symbolically to a certain point, but I can't find the symbolism. I mean, you know, what does it mean to have big blocks of that size? And people say, well, because they could do it. Well, obviously they could do it. But if they, if they wanted to impress others, then you would suppose that they would want to display those blocks, but they weren't displayed. The funny thing about these temples is that the core blocks are of the size I've been describing, but then they cladded them with granite, so you couldn't see them. You couldn't see this wonderful feat of engineering, so it wasn't to show off, it wasn't to impress others, and uh, so we're left with the huge question mark. You see, to me, these are the real anomalies of this country, that we, especially the pyramid ages, we have to break. We really have to understand this, sure. rather than just to leave it to the Egyptologists who are ignoring it. Sure. I think, okay, last question then, Robert. I think uh, a lot of people will speculate on the cosmology and their astronomy and the engineering and, and all the achievements that they left us, but I think one of the big achievements that they did and was their quest for e eternity, these to, to explore life after death and, and this, their consciousness, their spirituality or whatever, but I think a lot of people will refer to them as being obsessed with death when I don't actually see it like that myself. Do you see these guys as exploring their spirituality, their consciousness? Uh, I remember hearing uh, something amazingly obvious and yet not obvious to many. Uh, from uh, the late uh, Dr. Archie Roy, Professor Archie Roy, who was the astronomer of Glasgow University. Mm -hmm. He said people then must have 
had Einstein's and Newton's and there's no reason at all why there weren't people with the same intelligence that we have today. They had the same brain, the same people. So we're dealing with very bright people that didn't have the science and technology. And in many ways, in many ways, it might have been an advantage because it forced them to try and understand their existence with their mind. Mm. And in, in my view, this idea, I mean, the fundamentals are the same. I mean, uh, you know, people go about their lives and they, they, like I said, they drive cars, they watch TV, they go to work, they go to the movies, they travel. But the fundamentals are the same. You know, we're born, we have to eat, we have to drink, we have to defecate, we have to sleep, we have to fornicate, excuse the word, in order to procreate, and then we die. These are the fundamentals. Yeah. The same. What is in between? What we do in between these activities, these fundamentals, is the complexity. It just gets more complex. Yeah. You know, the more complex life becomes, the more distracted you are to using your brain in this way. They were not distracted like we. You know, it's amazing how much life is complex. I mean, I've just traveled from, from Malaga to here, and uh, planes and air tickets and seats and luggage, and <laughs> it's very, very complex. Sure. We take it for granted, but it's extremely complex. And therefore, we're, we're, we're caught in this complexity, and we don't use the brain to try and, and, and reason out the huge fundamental questions. What is life about? What are we here for? Is there life after death? Is there such a thing as eternity? Will we be uh, reborn again? These are big, big questions, because it, it, it is really something that we need to work out. Mm -hmm. And to me, to ignore this. Sure. in our civilization. I mean, it's, it's not cool. You know, people think that if you ask the big questions, you know, uh, what's life about, they start laughing, you know, I mean, uh, ah, forget it, that's going to have a pint of beer. And you know, is there life after that? No, you're some sort of lunatic, you know. No, no, this is what it's about. The meaning of our existence. We're on a planet and we have no idea why we're here. We have no idea where we came from and we definitely have no idea where we're going. And these are the big questions that need to be tackled because our, our civilization, our existence depends on understanding it. Otherwise we become indifferent, like I said earlier. We, we begin to think it's meaningless and let's blow each other up. So that's what the ancient Egyptians managed to do, I believe. And they, they weren't obsessed with death. They weren't, uh, people think, you know, mummies and temples and pyramids. No, no, no. They, they, if, if you study ancient Egypt, they, they absolutely loved life. I mean, they had a great time there, believe me. You know, you look at the, 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 the reliefs. These guys are having a great time. They're wonderful. They're fishing and they're hunting and they're dancing and they're doing rituals and liberated the women. I mean, if you look what's happening in Egypt now, veiled and covered. Women were, were not afraid of their nudity, they, they, they danced and they sang. They're very happy people, mm -hmm. but they tackled the big questions. They, 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 they wanted to get their whole existence into that frame. We, we have to do it. We have to reconnect. I very much believe so. I mean, I'm reaching this ripe old age of 65, I'm in the autumn, and I begin to, to think, my God, you know, the civilization is very strange yeah. and I see things happening around me I mean we, we become so complacent I mean uh, there is a war in Syria people are getting killed by the day yeah. people are blowing themselves up in Afghanistan in, in Iraq they're talking about nuclear armament in, in Iran it, it, it's becoming and we, we, we sit on the TV and we watch it and then we're going to have our meal yeah. we, we don't we don't feel it anymore detached you know there was a time uh, there was a time when just one person got killed, it was big news. Now we have hundreds of thousands of people get killed every day and we think, there was, there was, there was a, a huge storm in Indonesia, thousands, thousands of people got killed. There's a mess, we don't even read about it anymore, it was yesterday's news. We're becoming more and more indifferent to our existence because we've stopped pondering on the main issues. For sure. Robert, thank you for your time. Tonight. It's a pleasure.